I'm Josh Bowers. I'm a professor here. I'm also a co-director, together with Ann Coughlin, of the Law and Public Service Program. I'm very pleased to welcome Ben Wisner uh, to UVA Law today. Uh, ben is the director of the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, which is, in addition to many other things, dedicated to ensuring that civil liberties are enhanced rather than compromised by new advances in science and technology. Uh, ben has numer uh, litigated numerous cases involving post 9-11 civil liberties abuses. He's appeared regularly in the media. Uh, he's uh, traveled to Guantanamo Bay to monitor uh, military commission proceedings. Uh, he's a legal advisor to Edward Snowden. Um, I've known ben, ben for a long period of time. In, in fact, I, I met Ben during my first week in law school at NYU, and I have to say that the experience was completely dispiriting because um, I was uh, a 1L and Ben was a, a 2L and he was my torts TA. And I remember looking at him and listening to him and thinking, oh my God, I have to know that much by next year. I have to be that polished and uh, well-spoken and composed. Uh, as it turns out, um, I'm not the person in this building who has known Ben the longest. Uh, uh, Risa Golubov told me that uh, uh, she and Ben were uh, good friends in college. More surprising, perhaps, Ken Abraham came up to me uh, yesterday and said, uh, I remember Ben from when he was a toddler. I haven't seen him since. You may not remember Ken Abraham. Ken Abraham, well, and, and, and he's, a, he's a tort scholar, so that may explain, you know, your, your, your prowess as, as a torts TA. Um, but I, it struck me that that's a mark of an impressive intellect if you could make a lasting impression on Ken Abraham uh, at the age of, you know, 18 months or two years old. So uh, without further ado, uh, I, I'm really interesting, interested in hearing what Ben has to say, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you guys so much. Ben, so And look at which one of us turned out as a law professor. Right. Do you teach torts? I don't. You don't teach torts. Um, <laughs> hello, friends of Josh. Yeah. Um, thanks for that very warm introduction. I want to say a special thanks to, to Josh and to Anne for inviting me here and for hosting me and to, to all of you um, for spending an hour of your time with me this afternoon on a day when I know there are lots of events um, at the law school, um, including an event um, that many of you should go to right after this one, sponsored by BALSA um, on the grand jury and prosecutorial discretion and racial bias, uh, the post-Ferguson event. And that, that, I think, is just um, down the hall at 6. So if I see any of you slipping out uh, before we're done with Q&A here, if you're going there, you have my blessing um, in advance. Um, so, um, like a good law school paper, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about before I talk about it. Um, what I'm going to do today, in, in about 25 or 30 minutes, and I hope we'll have a lot of time for questions, um, is say a little bit about new surveillance technologies, uh, describe how I think we have inadequate legal protections in our current regime, um, then say a few words about why we should care, um, and then wrap up with some thoughts about the future. So right to it. Um, if we were to try to distill the um, really extraordinary global debate that we've had uh, around, uh, around the world in the last year and a half um, in response to the Snowden revelations to a single sentence, that sentence might be something like, surveillance technologies have outpaced democratic controls. Um, what do we mean by that? Um, you know, even before um, Snowden's disclosures through the media, um, we all could see, if we look closely, uh, that new technologies have fundamentally altered our lives and our world. Um, it used to be possible um, to live lives of what you might call practical obscurity. Uh, most of our activities were unobserved, they were unrecorded, except by the people immediately around us. So consider some common technologies. Um, the telephone. Um, there are probably people in this room who don't remember when the telephone was connected by a cord to something on the wall. Uh, and certainly people in this room who don't remember being in public places and actually going into a booth, closing the door, putting in a coin, uh, and making a phone call. Uh, last year, the New York Times, in an interesting article, said maybe we shouldn't call the things that we carry around in our pockets phones anymore. 
um, because one of the rarest activities that we use them for is actually talking on the phone. A better word for it would be tracker. Um, or as we call it at the ACLU, the little police officer in your pocket. Um, that device, uh, in order to, to work at all, um, is connecting um, every few seconds or minutes to cell phone towers in order to give receptions, um, to, to satellites sometimes for GPS location, um, and, and it's broadcasting its precise location in order to do that. Um, and your location actually says a fair amount about you, as one federal court described it. Um, location data can reveal whether a person is a weekly churchgoer, a heavy drinker, a regular at the gym, an unfaithful husband, an outpatient receiving medical treatment, an associate of particular individuals or political groups, and not just one such fact about a person, but all such facts. And this data, which is generated just by your using and carrying this phone, and which never existed before, is of great interest to the government. Uh, we've learned that governments make millions of requests per year to cell phone companies uh, to get information about cell phone location and usage. Uh, and there is a very spotty legal regime protecting that data. We'll come back to that later. That little cell phone, that little tracker, um, is also a computer. It stores your communications, your photos, all kinds of sensitive information. All right, what about mail and sending letters? Um, you know, I'm old enough that I used to write letters home from summer camp um, and send postcards from the places uh, that I went. Uh, we now live in a world where virtually nothing is deleted, um, that it is stored, you know, essentially forever in a digital cloud, um, sometimes with unpredictable consequences. Consider the case of Professor David Petraeus of the City University of New York, um, uh, whose email proved to be his undoing, even though he wasn't suspected of any wrongdoing. Uh, and again, here we have inadequate legal protections um, uh, at least under statutory law, there's no requirement always to get a warrant to get an email. In practice, probably the cops are getting a warrant to get emails, but, but, but the, the, the law has not kept pace here. We could go down the list. Um, newspapers, we used to actually put a quarter um, in a box and pull a newspaper out. Most of you, probably all of you, um, consume your news online. Your reading is being tracked by companies that are trying to link every single one of your clicks to your identity, shopping the same thing. Um, the, the, we used to go to used bookstores and, and record stores and thumb through things. Um, uh, you know, when you do that online, uh, you know, imagine the real life equivalent of somebody following you around with a clipboard everywhere you went in a store, and not just writing down what you buy, but writing down every single thing you look at. Um, so, you know, one thing that um, it, it, it relates to all of this. Um, and, and I think maybe one of the most important things um, that I'm going to say tonight uh, about the technology of surveillance, um, that in the past it used to be extremely expensive to store data like this. Um, that is not the case anymore. Uh, it used to be that companies and governments had to make decisions about what they were going to keep. Um, in 1980, uh, the hard drive storage cost per gigabyte was about $100,000. Now it's under 10 cents, which makes it virtually free. Uh, and what that means is that for the first time in human history, it's technologically and financially feasible for governments and corporations to record everything we say and do, phone conversations, emails, movements, associations, uh, and to store them forever. Uh, and this is really an important point because I think that, that in the past, um, our privacy was protected as much by cost um, as it was by law. Um, governments simply had to make decisions about who they were going to follow. Now they don't have to make those kinds of decisions anymore. Um, and so you get brilliant bureaucrats like the NSA's Keith Alexander, uh, whose mantra was, collect it all, collect it all. The authorities will follow, the uses will follow, but for now, let's collect it all. Uh, and you have programs that Snowden revealed where the NSA is storing the records of every American phone conversation, um, sitting on the internet backbone and siphoning off billions of communications every day from around the world. Uh, and it's not just governments, as I said, that are doing this, um, also corporations, um, which are mining your data to learn all kinds of things about you, sometimes things that you may not yet know about yourself. Uh, there was another very interesting article in the New York Times a couple of years ago um, about the Target Corporation. Target wanted to know when its customers were pregnant. 
Um, this is a very important piece of data for companies because pregnancy is one of the times in life when people change their habits, including their shopping habits. And if Target could bring pregnant women into the store, um, they might see that they could buy their orange juice there. They could buy all kinds of things that they were used to buying in other places. And so Target had a team of its statisticians and, statisticians and mathematicians um, try to solve the problem of which of their customers were pregnant. And it turned out not to be a very difficult problem for the mathematicians, given the amount of data that they had. Um, and, you know, I learned something reading this article. Apparently, pregnancy is associated with things like unscented lotions, um, certain kinds of vitamins, and cotton balls. Um, yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so Target began to send targeted ads and coupons for pregnancy-related products. Uh, and according to the New York Times article, um, they got an outraged phone call from the father of a teenage girl saying, why are you sending pregnancy products to my 16-year-old daughter? And then a week later, got a call from this person apologizing, saying that there were things going on in his household um, that he hadn't known about. Um, and so Target's response to this was not to stop engaging in this practice, but to disguise what it knew about its customers. So they would send the ad for diapers, but they would put it next to an ad for a lawnmower so, so that the person receiving it wouldn't know what Target knew uh, about them. And this all seems kind of harmless, right? Um, so Target sends you an ad for diapers. Um, but you can be sure that companies like Target and many less reputable companies whose names you don't know um, also know your mental health status, your sexual orientation, um, and other very highly sensitive information about you. Um, I would guess that it makes some people here uncomfortable that companies know and are selling to other companies the fact that you may be overweight or depressed or gay. Um, and, and all of this is essentially being done with your consent under the law uh, because of all those little boxes that you check in your daily life. Uh, and you don't read the privacy policies, I know that, um, because in order for you to read the privacy policies um, of the internet services that you use, you would have to spend three to four months of every year reading them. That, that's how much is in those and how many of them that you click through. Uh, and again, of course, um, all of this is driven by a business model um, that uh, essentially is based on the aggregation of data about you. Um, you, you might call it a surveillance economy. Um, you, you believe that you're getting information for free, uh, but what that really means is that you are not the customer, you're the product. Your information is being sold to these companies, real customers, who are other companies. There's actually a cartoon that expresses this very well. Uh, it's two pigs next to each other in a barn, and the first one says, isn't this great? We pay nothing for this barn. And the second one says, yes, even the food is free. Right? Um, it's a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, be careful what you don't pay for. So I want to be clear at this point, this is not intended to be any kind of Luddite polemic. Um, I, I am not, and it's really impossible to be anti-technology. Um, almost every technology that we've discussed um, has enormous social benefits as well. Um, I mean, the smartphone is an incredible instrument of convenience. I remember moving to Los Angeles in 2000 and having to buy this massive map it was hundreds of pages, and every time you needed to find an address, you would have to like find E6 on a certain page, and you know now you just plug this into a GPS, and it tells you where to go. Um, I love EasyPass. <laughs> you know, um, Google's analytics um, could probably prevent epidemics from spreading, given the amount of information that they have. Um, online shopping is a great convenience. Um, even social networks. Um, they are the most efficient means ever devised of compelling me to look at my friend's baby photos. <laughs> I mean, even take a technology like drones, which most of us associate with um, uh, targeted killings. Um, but actually imagine drones being operated by news organizations and human rights organizations. Um, how useful it would be if Human Rights Watch could fly drones over war zones, um, if news organizations could fly them over uh, uh, protests where cops were beating protesters or where violence was taking place. Um, these technologies are all here to stay. Opting out is not an option for almost all of us. Uh, but we have to remember that there is, you know, you might say an angel and a devil associated with every one of these technologies. Um, that GPS device is going to prevent me from getting lost, uh, but it also might help your stalker track you. 
if we want to prevent the benefits of these technologies from being a kind of devil's bargain, uh, we need to have the right kind of laws and rules that will protect and enforce our values. And here's where we get to the bad news part of this presentation. Uh, the laws have not remotely kept pace with these technologies. So starting on the consumer side, unlike basically every other Western democracy, we have no basic privacy law that governs the kind of data that companies can collect, the kind of transparency or choice that they have to offer to consumers, or how these companies can or cannot use the very sensitive information that they store about us. Um, all we have are those privacy policies that you click on. Um, and the primary federal statute that, govern, that, that governs government access to electronic information, uh, both real-time interception and stored communication, was enacted in 1986 uh, before the advent of the World Wide Web. And it has all kinds of arcane distinctions that make no sense in 2015. For example, emails that are stored for less than 180 days have more legal protection than emails that are stored for more than 180 days. Um, something, the rationale for it is almost lost in the mists of history. Uh, and what about the Fourth Amendment? Um, here the news is a little bit mixed, um, but let me start with the bad news so that we can end on a brighter note. Um, I think that the Fourth Amendment has, for the most part, done a poor job of keeping pace with technology for two principal reasons. And the first, for, for those of you who have taken criminal procedure or are taking it, um, is what's called the reasonable expectation of privacy test. Um, for about the last half century, the Supreme Court has evaluated Fourth Amendment intrusions on the basis of, these, of this test. Uh, did, did you have a reasonable expectation of privacy um, in the material or, or, or this, in the situation? Um, but how are we actually supposed to know? And how are courts supposed to decide whether any given expectation of privacy is reasonable? And I think a very common critique of this is that it's actually, if you take it seriously, a circular test. Um, our expectations of privacy depend on the amount of surveillance and incursion that we actually experience. And as new technologies make those incursions more pervasive, our expectations diminish. According to this rule, as our expectations diminish, there should be a corresponding diminution in constitutional protections. So what was intended to be a flexible rule um, has at times in practice been a kind of one-way ratchet downward where we continue to lose um, privacy rights, although um, there, there are some green shoots um, in this area that, that, I, that I will talk about in a moment. Um, the second reason is something called the third party doctrine. Um, the third party doctrine um, was essentially devised by the Supreme Court in the 1970s. Um, under this rule, we lose Fourth Amendment privacy rights over any information that we knowingly or voluntarily share with a third party. So for example, when you share information with a bank, um, you lose your ability to raise a Fourth Amendment objection when the government wants that information from the bank. Um, when you store documents and personal records with an internet service provider or a cloud computing service, under this test, if it were applied literally, um, you would lose your Fourth Amendment protection um, over those records. So think about this in constitutional terms. If you have a handwritten diary and you keep it in your desk drawer, the government would need a warrant under the Constitution to get it. Um, but if you save this as a Google document, um, and essentially Google is holding it for you, um, then you would not have Fourth Amendment protection. Um, and finally, and I think most relevant to this conversation, um, when you make a phone call, um, you lose constitutional protection over the metadata, the data about that phone call. The metadata of a phone call is who you're calling, the number you dial, how long that call takes, when you make that phone call. Uh, of course, you need to give the phone number to the phone company um, in order for the call to be connected. And the Supreme Court in 1979 said, once you've given that number to the phone company, um, you have no call to object when the government comes to the phone company um, and wants that number as well. Now, this 1979 case um, about phone calls and whether the to and from is protected um, is essentially the basis for most of the NSA's bulk collection programs in 2015. Um, the government's reasoning is if you have no, if one person 
has no constitutional protection over his phone calls in one day. It follows that all people have no constitutional, constitutional protection over all of their calls on all days. Um, you know, if you applied this kind of logic to the practice of medicine, um, you know, you would say because doctors say that one to two glasses of red wine a day uh, are good for you, you should have a million glasses of red wine, right? Um, it, it doesn't really make sense, but, but I want you to understand what the legal basis is for the government's claim that it can collect on a daily basis um, all of the metadata of all of our phone calls and store it for years without the Constitution having anything to say about it. Um, so, so this is the state of the law in 2012 when the Supreme Court heard a case called United States versus Jones, um, w which may turn out to be uh, really a landmark case in the history of the Fourth Amendment. We'll see uh, um, how that, that plays out. But Jones was a nightclub owner in Washington, D.C. The police believed that he was also a drug dealer. And so they crawled under his car and they attached a GPS device to his car uh, and they used it to track his movements for several weeks and on the basis of that location information, Jones was convicted. Um, he appeals and the case makes its way eventually to the US Supreme Court. Now from the government's point of view, this was a very easy case. How could Jones have a reasonable expectation of privacy or any expectation of privacy on public streets where he was driving his car? Um, he voluntarily revealed his location by traveling in public. The police certainly wouldn't need a warrant to follow him around the public streets if they followed him in a car. Why should they need a warrant to follow him electronically? Now Jones argued, his lawyers argued, there's a big difference between traditional surveillance, which would require teams of officers to follow somebody, probably in round-the-clock shifts, uh, and GPS monitoring, which if it were unregulated, would allow the police to monitor every citizen's whereabouts from the comfort of their desks. You can follow thousands of people in real time from, a, from one laptop. So from, from my perspective, the good news here is that all nine justices of the Supreme Court agreed that prolonged GPS tracking by the police constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, there was some peculiar reasoning in this case. The principal opinion is written by Justice Scalia. And Justice Scalia writes in the opinion that the GPS monitoring was a search, but not because of anybody's reasonable expectation of privacy. Those words are not in the Constitution. Um, but because the law enforcement officers had engaged in conduct that might have provided grounds in, 19, in 1791 for a suit for trespass to chattels. Um, it's fair to say that nobody saw that coming. Um, in a concurring opinion, Justice Scalia's usual ally on the court, Justice Alito, was pretty derisive of this idea that the Fourth Amendment status of GPS tracking turned on 18th century law enforcement practices. Uh, Alito wrote, is it possible to imagine a case in which a constable secreted himself somewhere in a coach and remained there for a long period of time in order to monitor the movements of the coach's owners? Justice Scalia suggests that something like this might have occurred in 1791, but this would have required either a gigantic coach, a very tiny constable, or both, not to mention a constable with incredible fortitude and patience. So Justice Alito agreed that GPS tracking was a search because, as he explained, society's expectation has been that law enforcement agents and others would not, and indeed in the main simply could not, secretly monitor and catalog every single movement of an individual's car for a long period of time. This seems right to me. But remember that the vast majority of location tracking occurs not when police crawl under your car and attach a device to it but when your mobile phone automatically communicates with a tower or a satellite. Uh, law enforcement probably do physical attachment GPS cases a few thousand times a year around the country. Uh, we know that they request cell phone records a few million times a year. Uh, and under the third party doctrine, arguably that information may not be entitled to Fourth Amendment protection, and that's an issue that we've been litigating now in courts around the country. So the Jones decision is clearly a step in the right direction, but we're going to be grappling with these issues uh, for a long time. So at this point, if you were my mother, you would be saying, that's all very interesting, but so what? Uh, what does any of this have to do with me? I haven't done anything wrong. I don't have anything to hide. If they need to invade my privacy to catch terrorists, 
or to send me advertisements? Why should I even care? Uh, and some of you might be saying, what privacy? We're all social media exhibitionists. The problem isn't privacy, it's oversharing. Or as Scott McNeely, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems famously put it, you already have zero privacy, get over it. So are we so voluntarily overexposed that sur the surveillance state is basically redundant? Do good people like us have nothing to hide? So what I wanna suggest today is that I think that that is the wrong answer to the wrong question. It's the wrong answer because everyone in this room, in fact, has plenty to hide. And it's the wrong question because privacy is not fundamentally about secrecy versus disclosure. It's about context and control and autonomy. So what do I mean when I say that every one of you has something to hide? Maybe we can start with the obvious. You probably close the door when you take a shower. You probably wouldn't post your credit card statements to your Facebook pages. You probably would not give me your email passwords. As the security expert Bruce Schneier has put it, we do nothing wrong when we make love or go to the bathroom. We're not deliberately hiding anything when we seek out private places for reflection or conversation. We keep private journals, sing in the privacy of the shower, and write letters to secret lovers and burn them. Privacy is a basic human need. And that to me is exactly right. People hide many things from even their closest friends that they're gay, that they're sick, that they're pregnant, that they're in love with someone else. There's a reason we call it a private life. Now, I am a professional civil libertarian. I obviously don't think there is anything wrong with viewing pornography or buying sex toys or picking my nose for that matter. But that doesn't mean that I don't want to hide those activities from almost all people. Privacy isn't about concealing vice. Secrecy would probably be a better word for that. It's about the human need for refuge from the eyes of the community and from the constant monitoring that living with other people involves. It's about the need for space in which to play, to try out new ideas, to try out new identities, to try out new behaviors without permanent consequences. The debate about privacy is so often presented in either or terms. Either we've chosen to keep something secret or we've decided to reveal it to the world. But so much of our lives falls right in between those two poles. And this is what I mean when I use words like context and control a minute ago. You might speak very loudly on your cell phone with little regard to whether you're overheard by somebody near you, but you're still appalled when a Rupert Murdoch tabloid hacks into your phone, um, not just because it's criminal, but because you've been profoundly violated. Uh, and maybe part of the problem is that privacy um, is too small a word uh, for the set of concerns that we have uh, uh, um, you know, about uh, you know, autonomy and context and control. Um, so let me, let me close and then take questions um, by um, saying a few optimistic words about what the future might hold. Um, and again, notwithstanding everything that we've learned about the NSA in recent months, a future without privacy is not inevitable. <clears throat> There's nothing inherent in technology that requires us to give up privacy. We can design our society however we choose. Now, if we don't choose, if we stand back and let these decisions be made by others, uh, then we will very likely see a world with less privacy. Um, Who is going to make those decisions if we don't? Well, we've seen government security agencies will make those decisions. They want as much information as possible. That's their job. Uh, we can't blame them. It's in their nature. Corporations are going to make those decisions. They want as much of our personal data as they can get. That's their business model. Uh, if there's going to be a constituency for stronger privacy protections, it's going to have to come from somewhere else, from the rest of us. And let me tell a couple of quick stories that might point away in this direction. You know, I said before that the law has not kept pace with technology. There are some notable exceptions to that statement. Um, one of them, believe it or not, is for video rental records. Does anybody in this room know what a video rental is? <laughs> it used to be that we had to go into these things called video stores, uh, and we would walk around for a while, and we would spend 45 minutes trying to choose a movie. We would argue with the people who we were with. Uh, eventually, we would choose something that we didn't really like. That was what it meant. Um, but that was how people got their movies. Now, in 1988, 
Um, a judge on the D.C. Circuit named Robert Bork was nominated to be a Supreme Court justice. And a local newspaper called the Washington City Paper went to Judge Bork's video rental store and managed to get his video rental records, which they then published um, in an attempt to embarrass him. Of course, it turns out that his records, at least the ones they got, were not terribly embarrassing. There was no pornography for rent um, at that store. He did rent a day at the races, Ruthless People, that was a good one, um, and The Man Who Knew Too Much. Um, I should say the ACLU, which opposed the Bork nomination, um, also blasted the Washington City paper for this um, gross violation of Judge Bork's privacy. We said it would be no different than going to the bookstores to get the titles of the books that he read. Um, but the ACLU, we were not the only ones to take notice of this. Um, 535 members of Congress were very, very nervous um, and imagined the publication of their own video rental records. Uh, and what followed was the video Privacy Protection Act, which has strong civil and criminal penalties um, for um, uh, you know, publishing uh, people's video rental records without permission. Um, one more story. I, I, I mentioned the Jones, the GPS case, where the Supreme Court held that GPS tracking was a search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, a very interesting exchange happened during the oral argument. The Chief Justice asked the lawyer for the government, um, is your argument that there would be no search if you went into the garage where the justices park their cars and put a GPS device on our cars. There was a little bit of hemming and hawing by the government lawyer, but ultimately he said, respectfully, Mr. Chief Justice, that would be no different than if the FBI um, had teams of agents following you around all the time, um, which was not the right answer. Um, uh, all of a sudden, the justices imagined being followed and having their locations tracked, um, and all of a sudden, the Fourth Amendment was was reborn in the in the technological age. You know, these stories have something in common, um, which is that powerful government officials realized that they had a personal stake, uh, that they had skin in the game, if you will. Uh, and if you take anything away from from this talk and Q and A that we'll have now, uh, I hope it is that when it comes to privacy. Every one of us has some skin in the game.